good evening. Good evening. Grab your Bibles and open them up to the Old Testament this evening. 1 Kings chapter 19 is where we're going to be. Looking at verses 1 to 8. And the message I'm calling, The Struggle is Real. If you know that the struggle is real, say amen. Amen. Let me ask that again. I was kind of weak. <laughs> if you know the struggle is real, say amen. Amen. All right. There we go. Last Sunday night, if you were here, I preached uh, a message called uh, Faith That Endures. Uh, the main point of that message was that if we have truly repented of our sins and placed our faith in Jesus, uh, then, then uh, our faith would endure to the end, right? So that's that's that we talked about last week, like true saving faith. So that we're moving on from that. That's like the next iteration of that. It's not. This is not about saving faith. This is this is about a working faith. This is about serving the Lord and, and remaining committed to Him and serving uh, in the way that He has called us to serve. But that's what we talk about. Some of the challenges that we face as we strive to endure. Sometimes the challenges come from a flawed understanding of what being a follower of Jesus is. It's out of ignorance. And as we like to say sometimes, ignorance sounds offensive, but it's not intended to be. It just means we just lack knowledge. It means we don't have a full understanding. So sometimes that's what causes us to be challenged. And sometimes the challenges come even when we have a, a, a full or robust, robust understanding of what the challenges you know, of being a follower of Jesus means. We knew it would be hard, but we just didn't realize it would be this hard. <laughs> well, it's harder than we expected. As if we were reading the scriptures and we see all the, that happened to Jesus and we, we see what happens to the apostles and all those. And, and we see, we know in church history, all these different things. And yet we like, and when it happens to us, we're kind of like, oh, 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 uh, oh, me too. I thought that was just them, not, not, not me. We know what happened, right, with Jesus, the apostles, what's been happening for 2,000 years of church history. But when it finally happens to us and the fiery darts start to rain down on us, that's when we come face to face with the fact that, that, that we are at war. Like, right? this is real. This isn't just a fairy tale. This is fiction. This is true. <laughs> it's still unfolding, right, as it plays out in our lives and all around the world. The first time we come under fire because of our faith is both shocking and sobering. It, it kind of causes us to, to snap out of it, right? We were kind of just kind of uh, going along and, and just going to church and doing our own things. And all of a sudden, we, we, we come under attack and we're like, whoa, 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 what is this? I was just, I was just coming to, I was coming to eat, grabbing potluck. I, I, I was coming to, to, to do, do Bible study and all, you know, all these things that we do, and they're good things. Now, don't hear me say that. I just, but, but then when we go, come under attack, we're like we're disoriented. Right. Like we're surprised. Like what, what's happening? It's kind of like a soldier that has, been, has completed boot camp and infantry training. They've been trained. They've been equipped for what to expect in combat. They have been through multiple simulations with Sometimes even with live rounds whizzing by their heads and having explosives, explosions going off nearby to kind of uh, climatize you for what combat would be like, right? So you're not kind of overwhelmed whenever it finally does happen. The instructor is doing all that they can to prepare them as best they can for the real thing. But nothing can fully prepare you for the real thing. That's right. Nothing. I think probably Bill will say the same thing with law enforcement. Until you come under fire from the bad guys, you ain't ready for it. You can train all you want, but until someone turns that gun at you, things get real. In the simulations, they know there are safeguards in place to keep them from harm. In the simulations, they know that there is a real enemy that's trying to take their life. But no simulation can fully prepare someone for the things they will see and experience in real combat. You, you, nothing can. That's why so many soldiers experience that experience combat, they come home with PTSD. Law enforcement, PTSD, the things you see, the things you experience. 
being under the threat of death for weeks or months on, on end can be traumatic. Being around death for weeks and months on end can be traumatic. Whether you're seeing your friends perish, seeing even enemies, anything, right? doesn't matter. Just being around it can be traumatic. Being wounded, whether it's mildly or severely, can be absolutely traumatizing. Every time a wounded soldier sees their scars or straps on their prosthetic limb, they have to kind of relive what happened. Every time they look in the mirror and they see those scars, in a way they can relive that. They can feel that burning sensation when that, that bullet ripped through their body. They're reminded of the trauma that they went through to some extent all over again. The struggle is real for the men and women that serve in combat and now have PTSD. But I also believe the struggle is real for Christians that are doing their best to be faithful to follow Jesus, to serve Him and engage in His mission. If you're doing the best, uh, the best you can to faithfully follow Jesus, and, and then, then you already know that the struggle is real. You know. More than likely, you've already experienced spiritual warfare in a deeply personal way. You've already have quite a few scars from the fiery darts of the enemy and a, some, a few scars from uh, friendly fire. Some of you have possibly been questioned whether you had what it takes to keep going. Maybe you're not cut out for, for this. More than likely, you have given some serious thought to pulling back or taking a break from serving the Lord. Again, I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about practicing your faith. Some of us have even given serious thought to retiring or resigning from serving the Lord altogether. A lot of pastors do that. Usually it's on Mondays. That's usually when it happens. Mondays. Black Mondays. So why does this happen? Because it's gotten much harder than we ever expected it to get. Right? Right. Knew it was going to be hard, didn't know it was going to be this hard. Because we're tired of getting threatened. We're tired of getting attacked. We're tired of living under the threat of being attacked. We're tired of fighting. Tired of pettiness. Right? All these things. We're just tired of it. It's nonsense. The struggle is real. And if you're struggling to continue serving the Lord in whatever capacity that you are serving Him now, you're in very good company. You're not alone. You're not the first one to, to feel this way. You're not the first one to struggle like this. Most of the heroes of our faith in the Bible and from church history struggle mightily with their desire to continue serving the Lord too. Many of them even struggled for the same reasons that many of us do. Elijah the prophet knew that the struggle is real. The more faithful we are in our service of the Lord, the bigger threats we become. Do you know that? We do. The bigger threats we become. The bigger the threats we become, the more attention we get from our enemy. So that being the case, just asking a, a question for, for you to answer for yourself to reflect on. How big of a threat do you think you, you presently present to our enemy? How big of a threat do you think that you are to the enemy right now in the way that you serve the Lord? Would you consider yourself to be a big threat or a little threat? Or if you're being honest, not much of a threat at all. You see, Elijah's faithful service to the Lord had made him a huge threat. A huge threat. In the previous chapter, Elijah had challenged the prophets of Baal to a big showdown. We, we, I mean, not long ago, we went through first, uh, first Kings in Sunday school. Big showdown. And the Lord showed up and showed out, making it clear that he alone was God. Humiliated them. The prophets... Made them look like fools. The people of Israel saw what had happened and fell on their faces and worshipped. And they were shouting, the Lord, He is God, over and over again. It was amazing. 
Then Elijah uh, uh, had all 450 prophets of Baal gathered up and had them executed. <laughs> That's one way of repentance. That's right. All right. Even King Ahab was eating and drinking and celebrating what the Lord had done. The drought was over. It was about to be. Anyway, rain was on the way. Three years of drought was coming to an end. Things could not have been going any better for Elijah as chapter 8 ended. But things rapidly began to deteriorate for Elijah in chapter 19. And that's what we'll see tonight. I believe we can learn quite a bit from the struggles of Elijah if we open ourselves up to God's Word. So stand if you're able to and let's honor the reading of God's Word together. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 to 8. Verse 1 begins, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more, more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of of that food, forty days and forty nights, as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. This is the word of God, Father in heaven. We thank you for this day that you've given us, Father. We ask that you would comfort us with your word tonight. Those who are are struggling, those who are considering throwing in the towel, those who who are contemplating. Given up, things have gotten too hard. Father, I pray that as we look at the example of Elijah, your prophet, and see how you dealt with him, that it would be a source of encouragement for us. So, Father, teach us your word tonight and help us to apply its truths to our lives. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The first thing that we see in our text tonight is the cause of the struggle. The cause of the struggle. All was well in Israel once again, or at least it should have been after what had just happened. King Ahab had returned home to Jezreel and told his wife Jezebel all that Elijah had done. And I tried to imagine in my mind, because it's, it's strange if, you, if you're familiar with the this account and, and who Ahab is and you know about Jezebel and all, it's kind of, it's just strange that he would come home and say, hey honey, guess what? Guess what Elijah did? And, and he's so excited and, and she, he's like, what are you, why, why are you excited about this? Right? He wasn't a big fan of, of, of Elijah either. And so he comes in and tells her what has happened. But Jezebel wasn't excited, not one bit. In fact, she was so enraged towards Elijah that she vowed that she would make sure that he would be dead within the next 24 hours. Or well, the gods could do the same thing or worse to her. Imagine that. That's, that's, that's pretty steep, huh? She's hot. And she wants him dead. Look at verses 1 to 3 again. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword and Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so 
let the gods do to me and more so more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. So what was it that caused Elijah to struggle? It was a legitimate threat on his life. A legitimate threat had been made against him. You see, Jezebel didn't really make threats. Jezebel made promises. Jezebel was ruthless. And she had the resources to carry out her threats. Right? She wasn't just saying this because she was mad. She had intentions on doing this very thing. She had hated Elijah before this. And after what had just happened, after her husband come home and told her all that had happened, expecting her to rejoice, which is silly. Her hatred for Elijah boiled over. She couldn't even envision a world where the two of them could coexist, that could be alive at the same time. One of us has to go. Either you're going to be dead or I'm going to be dead, but there's not going to be another day with both of us on this planet. That was her mindset. Have you ever been threatened like that before? Have you ever been threatened for your faith like that before? Have you ever been threatened because of the way that you were being faithful and serving the Lord? Because you were doing what God gifted and called you to do? That's what Elijah was doing. He is the prophet of God. He was doing precisely what God called him to do. And here he is under threat of his life. Have those threats ever caused you to struggle with your faithfulness towards God and your service to God, to His church? Now, we may not receive death threats like Elijah did, but it could still be a physical threat. It could also be a threat to our livelihoods, right? How we provide for ourselves and our families. That's part of it. That's a pretty big weight to hang over someone's head. You keep it up and see what's going to happen. What's going to happen to your family? How are you going to provide for your family when you don't have a job anymore? Right? They'll do that. It can happen. There are many different ways to threaten people, and our enemy knows all of them, and he knows which one to use. As the people of God, who is our true enemy? Satan is. Satan is and his demons. While it's true that Jezebel hated Elijah and wanted him dead, she wasn't Elijah's true enemy. She wasn't the, the greatest threat to Elijah. Satan was. Satan was using Jezebel's hatred for Elijah as a weapon to discourage and ultimately destroy the prophet of God if he could. And guess what? It was working. It was working. And if we're honest, a lot of times it works on us too, doesn't it? That's right. It works on us. Satan and his demons will work through people to accomplish their evil deeds. Satan and his demons will even work through saved people. Did you know that? He'll work through saved people, church people he'll work through. It happens all the time. Now to be clear, so you're not hearing me say something that I'm not saying... I'm not saying that saved people can be possessed by demons. I don't believe that. But I think that the Holy Spirit fills us and He doesn't, he doesn't take roommates. That's right. But saved people can definitely be manipulated and even weaponized by demons. I believe that. The Apostle Paul made this clear. The spiritual warfare and who our enemy is in Ephesians 6, 10-13. It says, finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Right? So there it is. That, that's that's our, our true enemy. That That's the one... Uh, 
true enemy that we have. It says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Perhaps Elijah had let his guard down after the huge victory over the prophets of Baal. Right? The war's over. Things have kind of calmed down and maybe he just kind of let his guard down. So we do that, right? That's right? We're trying to celebrate, man. Something wonderful is happening. So what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Perhaps he's grown weary of packing around that shield of faith. That thing gets heavy, you know. And he said, I'm a... I, we just had a victory and we're not really fighting and everything's calm and cool and everything's going great. So I, maybe I really, let me just set this down for a minute. Perhaps God allowed this to happen to keep him humble and dependent on God. We can't know with certainty what caused Elijah to respond the way that he did. But when this messenger delivered Jezebel's threat, we're told that Elijah ran for his life. Ran for his life. This should serve as a warning for all of us. Because if that can happen to Elijah, it can happen to us too. It can happen to us too. Because according to James 5.17, James 5, he has a nature just like ours. He wasn't a super Christian like the Apostle Paul. Not that he, he's just a faithful man of God. That's it. He has a nature just like us. A, a sinful nature as well. You see, oftentimes our greatest victories are followed by our greatest failures. Oftentimes our greatest victories are followed by our greatest failures. And so the question is, why is that? Because oftentimes when God allows us to experience some type of victory or break through our lives if we're not careful we tend to become prideful right mm -hmm. look look i'm strong look how strong i am i'm not strong god's strong that's right in fact when i am weak then he is strong Amen. that's what scripture tells us pride always comes before the fall so who is it that is threatening you right now and causing you to struggle in your willingness to be faithful in your service to the Lord? Who, who's your Jezebel? Right? Who is that? It might be a co-worker. It might be a supervisor at work. It might be a family member or, or a friend. Right? It could be anyone. It might even be another church member or a Christian doing this. Whoever it might be, don't do what Elijah did and run away. Don't do that. Don't run away. That doesn't resolve anything. It usually makes things worse, doesn't it? Instead of, instead of running away, run to your prayer closet. Amen. Run to your prayer closet and give your struggles to the Lord. Do what we're told to do in Philippians 4. 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. Some translate say, let your concerns. Your concerns. Elijah had a concern. We have concerns. Give them to God. And the peace of God, which surpass all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Number two. Second thing that we see is the consequence of the struggle. Elijah did what many of us do when we're facing conflict. He literally ran away. We may not literally run away, but sometimes we'll kind of, maybe we'll walk away. When struggles arise in our lives, depending on the severity of the struggle, many of us experience what's known as a, a fight or flight mindset. Right? We, we'll either, we'll either Choose to run away or we'll dig in and we'll fight. Sometimes we'll stand our ground and do the hard work that it takes to resolve whatever is causing the conflict. And I emphasize the hard work. The hard work to resolve conflict. We'll do what we need to do if we can to seek reconciliation if that's possible. 
if that's possible because it's not always possible. Just because I want to be reconciled doesn't mean you want to be reconciled. Just because you want to be reconciled doesn't mean I want to be reconciled. It takes two that's right. to bring about reconciliation. Other times we'll remove ourselves from the situation altogether or simply ignore it. But sometimes the conflict is so severe or it's been going on for so long that we come to the point where we are simply just done. Done. I'm just done. I'm done with it all. I'm done. I'm tired of talking about it. I'm tired of dealing with it. I'm tired of hearing about it. I'm done. Done. We're wore down and no fight is left in us. We're done trying to make peace with people that aren't interested in peace. Anybody know what I'm talking about? We're done trying to reconcile with people that, that aren't interested in reconciliation. Anybody know about that? Sometimes we come to the point where we're just done with everything. Everything. Have you ever come to the point where you're just done? Done with someone? Have you ever come to the point where you're just done with a situation? Because that's where Elijah was. Right? He was done. He wasn't just done with being a prophet and dealing with the consequences that came with that. He wasn't just done with, a, 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 with, a, with Jezebel and her threats. Guess what? He was done with everything. He was done with living. He was done, done. Look at what verse 4 says again. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die. And he said, it is enough. Exclamation point. He, he, he screamed that. I've had enough. It is enough. I've had enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I know better than my father's. Elijah's response seems rather sudden, but likely had been building for quite a while, like it does for us, right? Just Sometimes when we, we finally get to the point where we're done, it's not, it, didn't just, it didn't just happen overnight. It's sure. something that's been festering. It's something that's been building up over time. It wasn't just Jezebel's threat to take his life that triggered him to run away and pray for death. There were likely many other factors, many other things that he was struggling with. You see, Elijah was demonstrating classic symptoms of burnout. Burnout. Here are three warning signs. Warning sign number one is exhaustion. Exhaustion. Would, would, you, would you say that it seems as though Elijah was exhausted? Sure does. It seems that way to me. See, everything you once did now seems to drain the life out of you. All right? Things that you used to do, just a normal day's work or a normal activity, even things you used to enjoy and take pleasure in, now they just zap the strength from your body. Elijah wasn't just tired. Elijah was exhausted. Mentally exhausted, physically exhausted, emotionally exhausted, and, and, and most concerning of all, he was spiritually exhausted. Elijah not only shut down, he was ready to check out. He was ready to check out. He was praying for death. Which is ironic because he could have just surrendered to Je Jezebel and his prayer would have been answered. So I don't really believe that Elijah really wanted to die. I believe this was a cry for help. To his credit, Elijah cried out to the only one who could really help in this situation for him. He cried out to God, didn't he? And we should too. Because according to Psalm 46, 1, God is our refuge and strength and a very present help in times of trouble. And I also think the words of Isaiah 40, 28 to 31 are instructive here as well. It says, Have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the Creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, He increases strength. 
Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You feel like you're exhausted all the time? If you do, you may have you may have a vitamin deficiency, or you may be headed towards burnout. A second warning sign of burnout is disillusion. Disillusion. What once seemed hopeful has now become hopeless. Elijah had thought for sure that God's display of power on the mountaintop would have turned Israel back to a nation that was wholly devoted to him once again. But instead, their repentance was short-lived. And Elijah was completely disillusioned. King David struggled with disillusionment quite often as well. We can see it all throughout the book of Psalms. Do you find yourself becoming disillusioned? Do you find yourself feeling as if you're wasting your life on something or someone that is never going to change? If so, that might just be a warning sign that you're heading towards burnout. And warning sign number three, you have a distorted view of reality. You begin to only see the negative and begin to become paranoid of others' motives. Elijah had a distorted view of what God had just accomplished and he could not see that anything good was coming from it or going to come from it at all. Many of the Israelites had repented or, or appeared to repent, but Elijah could only focus on the ones that had not. His attention was on Ahab and, and Jezebel, right? That's where his focus was. If we look ahead to verse 10, Elijah began to feel like he was the only one left that was committed to faithfully serving the Lord. Verse 10 says, So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. you find yourself growing increasingly cynical or negative? Do you find yourself becoming distant and isolated from others? You see, if so, that's a warning sign that you're heading towards burnout. I appreciate this statement by Gary Henry. He said this, When people get big and the Lord gets small, we are headed for trouble. That's right. When people get big and the Lord gets small, we are headed for trouble. I, I would like to tweak that a little bit. That's a good statement. But I want to tweak it. We might replace the word people with the words our troubles. Right? So say it this way. When our troubles get big and the Lord gets small, we're headed for trouble. You see, ministry of any kind can be difficult because ministry requires interacting with who? People. Other sinners. Right? We're sinners. They're sinners. We get together, there's friction. It's tough. See, we need to have a means to honestly evaluate ourselves. We all need to have an accountability partner, a system of accountability, a friend that can speak truth and life into us. We all need that person. At least one. More than one will be great. <laughs> but at least one. We all have blind spots and most of us need help to see when we are headed for trouble. Now that saying, friends don't let friends drive drunk. Friends don't let friends burn out. Friends don't let friends burn out. Too often, we, we, after it happens, what do you always hear? I, I saw it going a mile away. I knew that was going to happen. I knew it was going to happen. Good for you. You're so observant. Why didn't you do anything? Why didn't, why didn't you say anything? Well, that's not, you know, that's not my business. I just, you know. If you're a member of this church, it's your business. 
When you decided you want to be a member of the church, it became your business. Right? It became your business. They take care of each other. Watch out for each other. Like Elijah, we will burn out too if we do not take steps to prevent it from happening. We need to learn how to set healthy boundaries and honor those boundaries. We need to be able to learn how to take breaks. Right? No work, no ministry related activities at all. Mondays for me, I go shopping. That's it. No sermon prep, no anything. Nothing ministry related. Now if there's an emergency comes up, yes. But other than that, Mike, Mike, we ain't, we ain't having Bible study with Mike on Mondays. We're just, we're just not. We're just, I'm just kind of. I need my mind needs to rest. My body needs to rest, and that's that's one of the ways that I do that. We all need that. A way to decompress. But the biggest thing for all of us, and I can't speak for ladies. I think it's, I think, I think it's true across the board. It's not just a man thing. I think it's a, it's a, it's a woman thing too. We need to all learn how to swallow our pride and ask for help. Amen. And ask for help. We aren't any good to God or anyone else if we burn ourselves out. That's right. We're not. So what was the consequence of Elijah's struggle? Burnout. Burnout. And it's like, all right, Brother Mike, can we get to something a little better? It's a little weighty. It's a little hard to listen to. Number three is good. The good this is the good stuff. Number three. The third thing we see in text is the comfort of God in the struggle. We have an enemy that wants to discourage us. We have an enemy that wants to defeat us. We have an enemy that only wants to destroy us. We have an enemy that wants to see us burn out and give up on serving the Lord. And he, he gets his way quite often, right. unfortunately. But more important than all that, we have a God that is for us. We have a God that is for us. Amen? Amen. We do. And that He wants us to prosper. And he wants us to endure in all that He has called us to do. He doesn't want us to quit. He doesn't want us to give up. We have a God that knows how we struggle. He is our creator. He is our God. He knows. We have a God that knows when we are growing weak and weary. Even when we lie to ourselves, we can't lie to Him. That's right. He knows. We have a God that is sympathetic of our frailty and weakness as His image bears. Hebrews 4.15 For we do not have a high priest talking about Jesus, the Son of God, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. You see, we have a God that will comfort us and strengthen us to get back up and get back into the fight. Get back up, bandage us up, patch up our wounds, encourage us, strengthen us, and then send us back into the fight. That's what God did for Elijah. Again, in verses 5 through 8. Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank and he went in the strength of the, that food forty days and forty nights as far as horror of the mountain of God. Elijah was done or he thought he was. He was checked out. Elijah was finished with all of it. Elijah did what people that are in the midst of burnout tend to do. He was, he was sleeping. Right? That's another warning sign of, of depression. When you're depressed, what do you do? You sleep. Why do you sleep? Because you're exhausted. Right? You sleep a lot. Elijah may have been finished, but God wasn't finished with Elijah. That's right. Right? We don't get to decide when we're done. 
God does. Notice what God did for Elijah. God did not chastise Elijah for running away from Jezebel. What are you doing, oh great man? Hey, what? How wimpy, how cowardly. Didn't you just see what I just did? You were big and brave whenever fire was falling from, he from heaven, rounding up all the prophets of Baal and having them executed. And here we are. You let one woman, one woman threaten you and you're ready to quit and die. What in the world is that? That's not what God did, is it? He, he didn't bring it up. None of it. He didn't mention any of that. No, God sent an angel of the Lord to give Elijah what he needed. Just a little nugget about the angel of the Lord. Just, just something to think about. I'm not saying that's what this is, but it could possibly be. Sometimes in Scripture, the angel of the Lord is a, is a, is a Christophany, a pre-incarnation of, of Christ. Operating, so this could very well be the Son of God before He manifest the incarnation. But the angel of the Lord came to him and gave Elijah what he needed. Elijah needed comfort, not criticism. That's right. He needed, that's now is not the time to point out everything you did wrong. Right? When somebody's in the midst of a depression, somebody's in the midst of burnout. It's, now is not time to start to get your list out about everything you messed up. There may be a time for that later, but that's not it. Elijah needed comfort and not criticism. Elijah needed hope. He needed encouragement. He needed to be refreshed and renewed physically, mentally, emotionally, and most of all, spiritually. You see, Elijah needed to be reminded of the faithfulness of God to him. He needed to be reminded that God loved him and he wasn't finished with him. And our God will do the same thing for us. Notice the angel of the Lord came to Elijah twice. All right, Elijah saw the, the bread and the, and the water and he ate and he drank and he laid back down. So the angel of the Lord came a second time. I, I can't say with certainty, but I imagine because I know the, the grace of God. I imagine that the angel of the Lord came to Elijah as many times as it took. Right? Because that's who God is. Our God is willing to do whatever it takes, as many times as it takes, to renew us and to restore us back to where He wants us to be because that's who our God is. That's right. God knew that Elijah would need to sustain, to, what He would need to sustain him for his journey to the mountain of God. The cake and the water alone wasn't what sustained Elijah for those 40 days and those 40s and 40 nights. No, it was God's presence that sustained him. And guess what's going to sustain us? It's the presence of God. Not just cake, not just food, not just a jar of water. God's presence. The trip to Horeb should have only taken two weeks. From what I read, it's about 250 miles. About two weeks. So why did it take so long for him to get there? Why was it 40 days? Sometimes in the Bible, you know, 40 days, the number 40 significant, time of testing, whatever. And that might be what's happening here to some extent, but I, to, to me, in my mind, I, the way I think of what's happening, God used this trip as a sabbatical for Elijah. Right? A sabbatical to, to kind of rest and recuperate and remember who he was. Remember what God had called him to do, to recharge his batteries, to be refreshed and to be renewed. You know what's funny about this or ironic? Remember what, remember what Elijah asked God to do? He didn't do that. He restored him. As a matter of fact, and you may, you, probably most of you already know this, Elijah never died. God never, never answered that prayer. He was taken away. He never answered that prayer for him. He got something much better. Brothers and sisters, the struggle is real. It's real. But so is the renewing and restoring grace of God. It's real too. That's right. It's real too. So in closing tonight, uh, our journey through life will be filled with highs and lows. I think we mentioned that tonight in discipleship. Just as a reminder, it's, 
I think we all know it, but sometimes we need to hear other people say that. We'll spend the majority of our lives in the valleys and not on the mountaintops. That's what makes mountaintop experiences mountaintop experiences. Right. They're rare, right? The more that we seek to be faithful to God, the more we make ourselves to be targets of our enemy. Being faithful to God will always be a struggle in this fallen world. It's never going to get easy. It may get easier, but I'm not even hopeful of that if we believe Scripture. It's going to get harder to be faithful to follow Jesus. If we can't follow Him now, if we can't be committed to Him now, if we're not willing to, 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 to commit ourselves to Him now when it's relatively simple, there's no persecution really just yet, what, what do you think is going to happen when it does get hard? You think our church is empty now? What's it gonna look like when, when, when it gets when it gets real? <laughs> when all that stuff we read about in the newspapers starts happening here. Right. Being faithful to God will always be met with op opposition and even hostility. And if we're not careful, we can find ourselves in the same condition as Elijah. The struggle is real. Burnout is real, but so is God's grace. Sometimes we'll be wounded and hurt by others, but we must remember and resist the temptation to view the, them individuals as our enemies. Because they're not. Powers and principalities are our enemies. They may be working through them, but they're not our enemies. We have one enemy. Sometimes we'll get to experience glorious breakthroughs and victories and we should rejoice and celebrate those and share those. Right. <laughs> I ask for praise reports every once in a while. I, I, I enjoy that. Amen. I want good news. I want to hear what God's doing. I, yes, I want to hear about your bobos and, and who's having surgery and who's sick and all that stuff. I want to. That's biblical. That's right. But it's also biblical, biblical to rejoice with those who rejoice. Right. I, I need that. And you need that. We'll get to experience sometimes soul-crushing losses and defeats. I don't have to tell you about that. No need to expound on that. Don't want to pick no scabs. We'll get to experience the highest of highs, the lowest of lows. We'll have seasons where we draw near to the Lord and others where He seems so, so distant from us. But He's not. That's just our perception. You see, church, God, our God is not only for us, our God is with us. Amen. Through thick or thin, a ride or die, God is our ride or die. Mm -hmm. He'll never leave us. He's never going to bail out on us. Hebrews 13, 5 tells us, For He Himself said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. What part of never do you not understand? Never. Never. Don't be shocked when you quickly move from being a hero to a zero like Elijah. Sometimes we do that. Sometimes it's the same day. Sometimes it's the same week. It might feel like it's the end of the world when we fail. But that's what the enemy wants us to think, isn't it? It's not the end of the world. The devil is a liar. He wants you to quit. He wants you to stop serving. He wants you to give up. Have your little pity party and bail out. Don't let him win. That's right. Don't give him that. Don't give him anything. In those seasons, we can be encouraged with knowing that God is not done with us yet. He still has plans and He still has purposes for us. Otherwise, He would bring us home to glory. That's right. When He was done with Elijah, what did He do with Him? Here comes the chariot. Bah, bah. Right? Come down, pick him up, and he was gone. Now, we don't get that service, but y'all understand what I'm saying. As long as we have breath in our lungs, as long as we have the capacity to, to worship him and to serve him, we're still here. When he's done with us, we'll know. We'll know. The struggle is real, but so were God's plans and purposes for our lives.
Let me pray for us and I'll have a, we'll have a time of response. Father, we thank you so much for this time we've been given tonight. Father, I know this is uh, not one of those messages that many of us enjoy listening to, but this is probably one of those messages that most of us need to hear more than different types. Many of us struggle in different ways, and we don't tell anybody, and we don't ask for help, and we try to hide it. And the silliest thing of all is that we even try to hide it from you. But you tell us to be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication to make our concerns known to you. You tell us to, to, to cast all our burdens upon you. And so, Father, I pray that, that tonight these words would not fall on deaf ears. That we would not just take this as another one of Brother Mike's sermons and, and check off Sunday. We had we heard a sermon Sunday morning and checked that box, and we heard another sermon Sunday night and checked that box. God, let, let, let your word do a deep work in us tonight. God, help us to turn to you, our strong tower, our refuge. Father, I pray that you would strengthen us. Strengthen us as individuals, strengthen us as a church. God, help us to keep our eyes on you. Let us not be petty. Let us not be vindictive. Help us fight the right fight. Help us fight the right enemy. God, thank you for loving us as you do. Thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. Father, thank you for your word to us tonight. Help us to take it and eat it, digest it, and apply it to our lives. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.